you mentioned that the Higgs field is switched on and it's of a particular value. Yes. Why is it switched on in the first place? And then can it be a different value? Can it be higher or lower? Why does it have to be this particular value? So what we mean by value is maybe worth a moment. So, you know, in this room, for example, um, the wind is calm. Uh, it has, its value is zero, as a physicist would say. And if we turned on a fan, then the wind would start blowing through the room. It would have a non-zero value and we would see the effect, right? Our, our hair would blow around. Yeah. The Higgs field, uh, in a somewhat similar way, is switched on throughout the universe. It has a non-zero value everywhere. That value is constant, both in time and in space, um, and, and has remained so since very early in the universe. Why? We don't know. We can describe why in the sense that we can write equations that would allow for it to happen. We don't fundamentally know why those are the right equations other than they agree with experiment. But we don't have some sort of conceptual notion that it had to be that way. And in a similar sense, conceptually, we don't know why the value couldn't have been smaller or larger. We do know why it has a value that, that is rigid and does not change. We know how to write down equations that explain that. But we don't know why that value couldn't have been zero or much larger. And that's actually one of the great puzzles that we face as particle physicists in that we do not have an explanation for why the value is what it is. And it's very important that the value is what it is because if the value was zero, then the electron wouldn't have a mass. If electrons didn't have mass, they couldn't stick to atoms. Atoms would fall apart. So it's very important that the Higgs field not only exists, but that its value is not zero. On the other hand, if, it's ma if, sorry, if the Higgs field's value were as big as it could be, then uh, the electron would have a huge mass, so would quarks and therefore protons and neutrons. And so every atom would have a huge mass, big enough that it would you know, either atoms themselves or anything significantly larger than an atom would, would, would form a black hole, which would be bad for you and me. It would, we, we, we like the fact that we're not black holes. And uh, we'd like to keep it that way. So it's important that the Higgs field's value is not zero, but it's also important that it's really, really small compared to what it could have been. Mm -hmm. And there is no explanation in particle physics today as to why it is so small. Uh, and worse, there's no explanation as to uh, how in a universe like ours with the types of particles and fields that it has, why it would turn out that it would have a value which is both non-zero and small in the following sense. When we write down speculative but more complete theories of the universe, which is something physicists do just to try to understand, well, given what we know, what types of worlds might we be living in? You know, what, could it maybe be this way with these additional particles? Or could there be some additional forces that we don't know about? And we explore those things just to get a sense for what the possibilities are. In those explorations, in some cases, you can calculate what the value of the Higgs field is. Okay, and again, those are speculative. None of those is necessarily the real world, but they're just explorations. What we find is that in all of those cases, it's very difficult to arrange that the Higgs field's value would be non-zero and small. It always seems to want to be zero or very big, or as big as it could be. And if you want to make it smaller, you can do it, but there are always additional particles and fields that become accessible to modern ongoing experiments. So in other words, if there is an explanation of this type for why the Higgs field's value is small, we would have expected that there would be other particles that have masses that are not so different from the particles that we know today, at least the heaviest ones, that they would be being produced at the Large Hadron Collider today and over the last 10 years, and we should have seen a sign of them by now. So since the Large Hadron Collider has not seen any particles uh, that are elementary other than the Higgs field, it has found all sorts of interesting particles that are not elementary, but in terms of elementary particles, the only particle that's discovered is, is the Higgs field. It's the Higgs, Bo sorry, the Higgs boson, the ripple of the Higgs field. Then uh, the fact that we haven't found others suggests that there's some way that we're thinking about the, the universe that isn't quite right. 
Because again, every time we do try to think about the universe in a bit of a more complete way and work out in that speculative world how the Higgs field might work and what, what its value might be, we don't find easily what we actually observe and experiment. So there's a, there's a puzzle here. This is called the hierarchy puzzle or the naturalness puzzle. And uh, there are various people out there who suggest that this is just a metaphysical problem. I don't agree with them. It's really a problem of dimensional analysis. So here's, here's a way to say it. Do you, you, you may know that physicists knew that atoms were determined by quantum physics, the quantum physics that Einstein um, in, invented in, in, or proposed in 1905, that somehow quantum physics was important in atoms. They knew this in 1911, before Bohr invented his theory of the hydrogen atom, which was the first real model of the atom. And they knew this through an argument of, uh, of, of essentially an argument about uh, scales and distances based on fundamental principles. They figured this out using a technique called dimensional analysis. In a similar way, Einstein knew before he ever calculated it, he knew that his theory of gravity had a chance of explaining the deviations of the orbit of Mercury from Newton's prediction. He knew it because of an argument of dimensional analysis before he ever started calculating. And I doubt that if he, had, if he hadn't had that kind of argument, I suspect he would not have taken on that, that calculation with as much confidence. When you run dimensional analysis arguments in physics, they almost always work. And when they don't work, there's almost always a reason. And dimensional analysis says that the value of the Higgs field should either be zero or it should be comparable to the scale of the smallest, uh, the should be comparable to the mass of the smallest possible black hole. At least if the world is only the particles we know plus gravity. If you add more fields and particles, you have to run the analysis again. But if the universe really were just the fields and particles that we know plus gravity, then this argument should hold. And it, it just doesn't experimentally. So then that suggests that, well, okay, your assumption that the world is only the particles and fields we know plus gravity should be wrong. There should be other fields and particles around. And in particular, there should be ones that interact with the Higgs field in order to change its value. But in order for that to be the case, their masses should, the masses of those particles should be comparable to the ones we know. We should be seeing them at the Large Hadron Collider, and we don't. So that creates a, a somewhat of a logical paradox. And um, there's presumably, well, I shouldn't say presumably, there is possibly something very important about the universe that we're missing, which explains why this argument is not working. But we have not found it yet. So that's part of why physicists are still very confident that uh, particle physics is not over. It's not the only reason. There's many puzzles in particle physics that we still do not have answers to. It's clear that particle physics is not at the end of its story. If anything, we have more puzzles now than, than we did before, uh, before we found the Higgs field, because you know we might have found the Higgs field and answers to lots of questions, but just getting the Higgs field and one Higgs boson leaves all the questions open. And so uh, particle physics is a long, long way to go uh, into the future. But at least we have kind of a, it's as though we have a short story that is now sort of complete with lots of loose ends, which tell us there's lots more chapters to read. But the particles we know and the Higgs field together form a kind of complete uh, package, again, with lots of loose ends, that, um, that, that on the one hand, it's a good, it, it's a good thing that we now have a coherent story for the particles and fields that we know. And the bad thing is we have all these loose ends and no clues about them. So that's a, a it's sort of a strange time because this wasn't true for the past 150 years. For 150 years, well, maybe 140, we, we've had an incomplete story of particles. And we've known that it's incomplete. And we've known that there's something right around the corner that will help us answer some of those questions. And today, we have more of a complete so short story, but we have no idea uh, which direction to go to answer the many unanswered questions that still remain. So that's the challenge for our for our time. Mm -hmm.